Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming to tonight's dialogue. Um, Death of Aleppo, a city under siege with Ima Vitelli, an international correspondent for Vanity Fair Italy. She holds a bounty of experience through vigorous reporting on conflicts across many cultural borders. She studied at Columbia University, obtaining her master's degree in journalism. Her nine years of living in the Middle East enabled her to explore and understand significant global events. From the effects of the Iraq war to the fall of Gaddafi in Libya, Vitelli reported through her eyewitness experience. Her book, Tahrir, published in 2012 on the Egyptian revolution is one, of, one example of her publications resulting from her firsthand experience in the region. Her recent devotion to Syria enables her to generously provide us with a presentation on the de devastating events of the Syrian civil war. Tomorrow she will be holding a writing workshop for NYU students at 4 p.m. in Villa Sassetti. If you wish to participate, you can RSVP after the event or send an email to La Pietra Dialogues. Um, and now let's give a warm welcome to Ima Vitelli. <laughs> Thank you. come back here. I'm always happy to come back here, even though this is one conference, one talk that I wished I would never have to do, because um, Aleppo is a very personal story for me. It's one of those places that I used to know very well before the war, when I lived in Beirut. I would take the taxi and go and enjoy his beauty, his Armenian Christian quarters, his old citadel. Halab means milk in Arabic. Has a very long history. It's been one of the um, cities like Damascus inhabited since 5,000 before Christ. It's one of those places where you go to and you just wish that humans would preserve it. The way, the feeling that you have when you are in Rome and you look at the forum, um, there are ruins, but they talk about us. It's about memory, it's about who we are. Aleppo used to be at peace until 2012. For 500 years, we need maps. For 500 years it was Ottoman, but before being Ottoman it was all sorts of things because of his position, because of his location. We don't have the rest, but basically Aleppo is between the desert, Raqqa, and the sea. This is the coast. And then here there is Turkey, Anatolia, mountains. And here there is the Furat, the Euphrat River. And because of his position at the center of all of this, he's been always pretty much Obviously, then it changed masters throughout history. And in the most recent history was Ottoman. But, but in, in, in Aleppo, there is Ebla, 35 miles southwest. Ebla, this marvelous, ancient, fabulously wealthy kingdom. Ebla, where they found this archive with tablets saying that in Aleppo, there was a king 2,500 years before Christ. This is what we're talking about, where we're talking about Aleppo. And this is what we're talking about, where we talk about Syria right now. Just to give you an idea where Aleppo is, Aleppo is 200 miles north of Damascus. And this is Syria at war right now, with different parts and different factions taking chunks of the country and 
fighting over the spoils and fighting over the poor Syrian people. We all know the numbers, but it's like they don't give you a real idea. Okay, we have UNHCR says there are 4.8 million refugees, but think about this. So it's like I have friends whose relatives, father and mothers, were not able to register with UNHCR. So it's probably what? Who knows what? Five million, six million? You know, it's just enormous. The catastrophe is enormous. The destruction is just unbelievable. You just saw what's happening in Aleppo. But what's happening in Aleppo right now is, is heartbreaking in its size, but has already happened in places like Homs, for example. It has already happened in places around Damascus. It has already happened since the regime started bombing at the beginning of 2012. The revolution started in 2011. It was an intifada, very peaceful. The regime started bombing civilian areas at the beginning of 2012. Rebels came to Aleppo from the countryside, from the north, and entered from the east. And this is the reason why the city is divided. It's been divided ever since the summer of 2012. I went there with the rebels. We moved from a place called Tal Rifat. This was last time that I went to Aleppo, simply because afterwards they start kidnapping reporters like me, so it was not possible to go back. You might remember what happened to other journalists, to photographers who were beheaded. Um, Jim Foley, Steve Sotloff, my ring a bell. This is the reason why whenever I report on Aleppo, it's simply not possible. In this map, it's not possible to go there. So it, it, it's all the reporting seems really dry because we're talking about numbers because we don't, you know, we can't be there. So we need to rely on people that we know and we need to choose the people that we can rely on because otherwise, you know, you don't know what you're publishing. And this has been one of the, I think, one of the most, uh, the hardest difficulties for people like me in the media industry. But because I've lived in the Middle East and I know a lot of people, um, I'm still able to kind of keep in touch. And bearing witness has never been as painful, I think. This is Aleppo right now, and um, the east part in gray is in rebel hands, opposition hands. The rest is government control. ISIS is um, al-Bab, which is far away from Aleppo. ISIS is the Islamic State, but basically the place under siege right now is the gray, this gray spot where there used to be um, two million people, now there are 200,000, um, and where there is a siege going on. Ever since September the 5th, the government managed to surround Eastern Aleppo. There are about 20 neighborhoods no one knows how many fighters are there. So they, they managed to surrender completely Eastern Aleppo by having troops, mainly Iraqi, Lebanese militia. Hezbollah is basically doing most of the groundwork. And ever since, the people, mostly civilians, and a few thousand fighters are cut off from the world and bombed every day by the Russians. Even the last humanitarian corridor that they had leading to Turkey, you can see the border up north, there is Turkey there. Even that humanitarian road called the Castello Road from an old hotel that used to be there, but it's no longer there. The old Castello Road is one of those scenes that takes you back to World War II. Dresda. I don't know whether you watched any World War II kind of documentaries or movies. There, are, um, there is not one single wall standing. Um, there are bodies all over the road, and there are mines, and there are, on any given day, between 10 and 12 Russian jets flying over. This information I got by interviewing a lot of people who told me the same thing. The way you do about this when you have a situation where you go to the closest point you can go to, and in my case is Gaziantep. Gaziantep, as I say, is our window on the tragedy. Gaziantep is, the, uh, is in Turkey. It is um, near Babeslam, which is on the border with 
Aleppo. Aleppo is about 60 miles from the border. No, 60 miles from Gaziantep. It's about 60 kilometers from the border. So we're basically right there, 60 kilometers from this disaster, where the Castello Road starts and where the Russian planes are bombing every day. So the way I, I got everything I'm sharing with you tonight is interviewing a lot of people, people who left, who managed to leave Aleppo right before the siege on September the 5th, people who were inside. I interviewed about 20 people, and, and they basically, from different sources, told me the situation on the ground. One of the most heartbreaking things about the siege and is the loss of children. Now, you might, it's like I'm, I'm talking about numbers and it's horrible, but you might know that ever since the war started, half a million people died. 10% of those, so about 50,000 were in Aleppo. And no one has been counting them very accurately because it's impossible, but I think it's a fair number to say that about 50-60% of those are ch children. One of the policies of the Russians and the Syrians, the Russians intervened last year in September 2015. One of their policies, it's a policy, has been to target civilians. Why are they doing that? They are targeting civilians because by targeting civilians, they want to cause the surrender of the fighters. So why they're not just fighting? Because they're not equipped to fight a urban warfare. Because the fighters are local, they know the terrain, they know the streets, they know their neighborhoods, they can't get in. It's impossible for them to get in. So they're bombing them. They're bombing the family of the fighters, they're bombing anything, any gathering, any place they might deliver services to civilians. They're bombing bakeries, they're bombing makeshift hospitals. In the past four months, they bombed 48 makeshift hospitals all over Syria. Only in Aleppo, in East Aleppo, there used to be, it's, East Aleppo is not quite accurate because actually the, the, the opposition has two thirds of the city. It's not just the East. So it's two, -thirds, two thirds of the city are in opposi opposition ends, but the government is controlling the highways. Remember, in every conflict, if you control the highways, you have the, the upper hand. So basically right now, the government is controlling the highway to Turkey and the highway to the South. So this is the way they're encircling the place. And the way they've been targeting bakeries and makeshift hospitals in Aleppo, it's been just constant. Um, there used to be 21 makeshift hospitals in Aleppo, now there are only um, six left. And because they bomb them frequently, um, they have code names. So they call them M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6. Mustashfa stands for M. And they change location. But even this, changing location, and, 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 and trying to use codes is not longer very helpful. Why? Because ever since the new offensive started, the, the regime decided there was a collapse of a ceasefire, of a ceasefire on September the 19th. And um, the regime, in the presence of president, president, uh, anyway, Assad, Bashar al-Assad, um, said that they were going to take Aleppo. Why now? The timing is very important. The timing is very important. They t they're taking advantage of the American, um, uh, you know, pre presidential elections. They do know that right now they have time until the end of the year to do whatever they want because no one is going to change any policy in Washington, no one is going to do anything in, in Washington, and so they think they do have until the end of December to do whatever they please to take Aleppo, and this is exactly what they're doing. Starting September the 19th, the last week of September, we had 150 raids a day. I talked to a doctor in one of those six remaining make makeshift hospitals, there used to be 20, in Ale 21 in Aleppo, now there are only six. And it was already kind of impressive that he was able to talk to me because um, they only have four surgeons. And at the end of September, they had something like 
600 dead people and 1,200 wounded people with three operating tables, three rooms that were equipped to have uh, surgeries. I talked to this doctor one night. I talked on Skype. And this has been one of uh, my, my um, recurring um, nightmares. Because whenever I talk to people inside Aleppo, it is like what hurts them the most, yes, it's the bombing, the death. They don't know where to bury people anymore. But it's their solitude, the abandonment, the perceived abandonment. Every single person I interviewed in Aleppo, they would just ask me the same question over and over. And the question would be, it's unbelievable. No one can ever say that you don't know. We don't know how to package this. We don't know how to tell you. Don't you know what's going on? And of course we do know what's going on because the Aleppo Media Center has been this group of very brave volunteer, volunteer um, citizen journalists. People who are there very bravely, you know, they risk dying every single day and they send us pictures and videos and we see them and they attract our attention for a news cycle and then we forgot. So this doctor, was outraged at our obsession with ISIS. He was telling me, you know, you don't realize that your obsession with ISIS has, has distracted the world from the crimes of the regime, really. Um, I asked him to tell me what one of his days was like. And he said, what do you want me to tell me? I'm a urologist and I'm performing surgeries. We are running out of antibiotics. I had people lying outside and dying on the sidewalk because there is no room inside. What can I tell you? I just lost Malak. And I was like, who's Malak? Malak is this one-year-old girl. Her father and mother died under bombardment, so Malak, who was one-year-old, was with a neighbor. And then their house was bombed too, and, and they all came here and we stabilized Malak, she had shrapnel in her spine and she breathed again and we thought that she could survive but then we do not have emergency for children and so we needed to send her to Turkey, she could have lived, she lived three days and I just lost her. So he was, he was telling me that every single day was a defeat. Every single day was a defeat, especially since the Russians with the regime forces, since they launched this new offensive on September the 19th, they're using on civilians Bunker busting bombs. There, one person that I talked to defined those bombs as elefantesque. I don't even know whether that is a word, but I thought that it was quite effective. You know, they're enormous bombs. So those are the bombs that the Israelis were launching on nuclear bunkers in Iran, trying to stop Iranian um, nuclear program, okay, and they're, and they're launching, dropping these bombs on civilians. What this means is that if you launch a, a, a bunker busting bomb on a building, the whole building collapses. The way the people managed, the, the, the way people in East Aleppo managed to survive was in a very clever way. This is true of every single war and every single siege. It's true with Sarajevo, you name it. Um, in London, 43, um, World War II, whatever war, ever since there were planes up in the air dropping bombs, civilians found refuge downstairs. But these shelters, they, they basically was just, you know, downstairs. They, you get, a, you get a, a star ways and, and then you go to the building and, and you just spend time there, even if it's dark, because it's a place that it's very far away from the fourth or fifth floor that it's going to be hit. And so you live there. If, if you, you know, can define that a, a life. But then it was precious for them, it turned out, on September the 19th, when they start dropping those bombs. So th their entire life moved downstairs in these basements. And now they discover that their refuge and their shelters are actually traps. Because you have civilians um, who are buried under two, three, four floors under bunker busting bombs. And so what happens is this. Well, this is actually good. 
because they're retrieving the bodies. I talked to a white helmet. This is actually good because they found the body. What the white helmets are the civil defense. They're, again, a group of volunteers. They realized ever since the Syrian regime started using um, aircraft against civilians that someone had to get the bodies out. No one was doing that. And the families were trying to dig in the rubble and they didn't know what they were doing and so they made things worse. So at the beginning it was just a group of friends, you know, the local mechanic, um, the, the tailor, um, the students, people who just wanted to do something. They, these people didn't want to fight. It was not for them to fight. They didn't want to take up arms. They didn't want to kill people. They wanted, they wanted to rescue people. So, so the white helmets will finance a certain point by an NGO. This is what the West has been doing. You know, part of our um, non-lethal aid has to do with letting people get killed, but then we help them and bury them and take them out of the rubble. This is what we're doing. What we're doing is humanitarian. We help you, you know, come out of the rubble, but, but we're not really, the West has not really been interested in kind of preventing or stopping the killing. The head of the white helmets was telling me, and that was particularly painful too, that they reached the point where there is no more land in East Aleppo where they can bury people. And so they use gardens of ancient homes. Um, they, they use private homes to bury people. They use whatever, whatever, whatever space, whatever land they can find to bury people. And they bury people when they can bury people, 10 or 12, because there is no room. And they reach the point where they're not naming people. They're numbers, too, because there are too many. He told me at a certain point that he found a hand, a little hand, and one of his recurring nightmares was whose parent was missing his child's hand. Because there are just too many. One of the person that really moved me but you must have gathered by now that I'm very emotional. It was hard. One of the people that really moved him was this guy. Now, what is the Russian press saying? Um, the Russian, Iranian, I just got a message from a guy who works for Hezbollah telling me that in Aleppo and Mosul, lumping them together, uh, we're finally killing them all off, all the terrorists, you know, we're killing terrorists. This has been a huge theme, a huge thing, you know, we're killing terrorists. The people in Aleppo, the people under siege, are terrorists. And there is a lot of confusion going on because of our obsession with ISIS. And, and I, 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 I played my role, I played my part in my obsession with ISIS. I wrote my stories about ISIS. They were so grotesque and, and so... They, they just went beyond anything evil that we ever kind of in, experienced and encountered in our experience as reporters. And so, yes, we were played by ISIS because we covered them too much and we forgot to cover who, you know, we were distracted by them, by their very clever propaganda machine. At a certain point, we played the game, not only of ISIS, but we played the game of the regime as well, because this is exactly what the regime wanted, what Bashar al-Assad wanted. Bashar al-Assad wanted for us, for the rest of the world, to think that the rest of the opposition was all ISIS. But this is not true. And in fact, in Aleppo, in East Aleppo, we don't really know how many thousands of fighters are, are there left, but they are the locals. I met, when I met them back in 2012, they were locals. The commander was a guy who was um, a honey maker. He had bees. This was the commander of the Liwa Atahuit back in 2012. And he was from the countryside, yes. But the people that I met, I met some fighters on the border in Gaziantep. Some of those fighters were stuck outside when the siege started. They went to Gaziantep to take their families and their kids. They wanted their wives and their children to be safe. And then they were stuck outside, I couldn't go back. So I met some of those fighters who were 
outraged is um, an understatement. Because one of the things that we don't understand is that there is a price and there is a cost of not doing anything. We think that not doing anything is just not doing anything, but actually not doing anything means something as consequences. It's a form of action. The reality is, and this again was told, I, I, I learned this talking to different people outside Aleppo and inside Aleppo. The reality is that the people in East Aleppo are whatever it means, FSA, Freedom Syrian Army, which means local and in theory supported by the US and 10, 11 other countries, depending on which way you count, which means Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, but America. This is, these are our so-called allies in East Aleppo. The reason why we're not giving them the arms, America, America is not giving them the arms to shoot down Russian planes is because they think, they're afraid that these man pads, these anti-aircraft arms might end up in, you know, with Nusra, which would be Al-Qaeda, or with Daesh, which would be the Islamic State. So basically our allies do not have the arms, the regime as Russia was bombing civilians and America doesn't give his allies on the ground the arms to shoot down Russia. It's, just, it's, it's complicated, but you get the picture more or less, okay? And so this guy, we don't understand by doing this, the consequence would be this guy telling me we will become all Nusra. We will become, this is like America has one policy for us and that is to die. So our option is to become all Nusra. What else are we supposed to do? If Nusra is our only ally, if no one is helping us, you see the unintended consequences of inaction. You leave an empty space, you create conditions for nihilism, and then you have to deal with the repercussions. I like this guy, terrorist, right? They're saying they're terrorists in East Aleppo. Terrorists, we identify, we, we, when we think about terrorists, um, um, Islamist, extremist, the Muntatarifin, you know, these bearded guys, Taliban's, Daesh, ISIS, okay. This guy is called Ahmad Abush, yes, he's singing. And this is a Sufi Darwish, and he's swirling. And this happened before the regime bombed them, because they did, in the Waraka Center. It was bombed a few months back, a few months before the siege. I mean, look at this picture. These are Sufi Muslims. The Sufi are the mystics of Islam. Everything these people are doing are considered blasphemy by the extremists. They don't like people singing, they don't like people dancing. There's like, if you think about the Taliban or Daesh or everything, they are as bad as us, infidels, okay? This was happening in Aleppo until the regime bombed the Waraka Center, one of the beautiful centers that was in East Aleppo. I reached, Ahmad Abush was, was a big guy, he's a famous guy. He, when I talked to him, I, told, I, 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 um, I asked him what you're doing there because the rich fled. You know, the people who are stuck in a siege situation are the people who can't afford to leave. Right now, to get to Turkey is 1,000 bucks. $1,000, you pay a smuggler. No, not even right now, because of the siege, you don't. You cannot, you cannot leave. But before the siege, before September the 5th, if you want to go to Turkey, because Turkey has shut the border, because it's got 3 million refugees already. So before the siege, Turkey had shut down the border. $1,000 with a smuggler. A smuggler would take you across Babes Salam, and you would be in Gaziantep and in Kilis. Now, you $1,000. But what the war does, it's making the rich poor and the poor beggars. This is what the war does. And so most of the shiuch, the sheikhs, the religious people fled, left. It was very bad already before the siege. This guy who sang in 100, he told me 100 capitals with the Kindi band, 
He was supposed to, he was so proud. He said, I sang in Paris and in Washington, D.C., you know, and I was in Milan once, and, and I asked him, Sheikh, what are you doing there? And he said, what do you mean what I'm doing here? I'm, I'm singing. And I said, you're singing? Yes, I'm singing. I'm singing for the fighters. I'm singing for my people, and I'm collecting the pieces. And like, what do you mean you're collecting the pieces? Well, yesterday there was this bombing at this bakery. There was this line of orphans and widows. Again, the people left behind are the ones who have nothing, are the ones who go and queue for bread at 3.30 at in the morning because they don't have anything. And there is very little flour, and I will tell you the, the impact of the siege. But the sheikh was telling me yesterday, there is this bakery next to my house, and the Russians came, and there was a slaughter, and I picked up pieces all day, and there were some chickens too. And at a certain point, I didn't know whether it was a chicken or human. And then he said something that really hit me. He said, Rahma, which means, um, in Italian it would be pietà, but it's um, misericordia. Mercy. He said, mercy. He said, mercy. If there is one thing that you can get out of this conversation, mercy, please let it be mercy. Let it be mercy. You don't know our conditions. Um, so, so, you see, this is a little different from, from the, the confusing image that we have of these people hold up under siege in East Aleppo, of Sufi Muslims. But they are the real enemy for Bashar al-Assad because they are the real people who said no to his regime. This is why the Russians are not bombing Raqqa, where Daesh is. ISIS is in Raqqa, to the northeast, some 150 miles um, east of Aleppo. No one is bombing Raqqa right now. They're bombing Aleppo. Why are they bombing Aleppo? They're bombing Aleppo because in Aleppo they have the local fighters they have the people who really represent the fabric of society. And why are they doing this in Aleppo? They're doing this in Aleppo because Aleppo is where 60% of the population, the Aleppo gov governorate and the coast, with Damascus, of course, is where most of the people live. 60% of the population used to be there. And it used to be the industrial capital of Syria. And it was the biggest city in Syria. So basically, if you control Aleppo, if the regime controls Aleppo, then it will control this corridor that we saw here from Damascus, the coast, and then up to Aleppo, then what would they, they can take Raqqa easily, the Russians, if they want to, then basically the opposition will be left only with Idlib, this enclave here. And why Aleppo? Aleppo used to be under the Ottoman Empire. They used to be, Aleppo used to be in the same governorate with Mosul, where the fight is going on, and Gaziantep in Turkey. So Turkey really much would like Aleppo, but Iran really much would like Aleppo because you know the local powerhouses are Iran and Turkey. So this is the geopolitical aspect to this. Um, I thought it was important for me to share you the, the story of Sheikh Habush because when I talked to him, I was, I was, you know, people are not really aware of who is inside. And of course, we remember, we occasionally tune in and remember what's happening in Syria when there is a picture that goes viral. And it's part of the news cycle for one day or two. And then we forget about it. And then there are new atrocities that really surpass all previous atrocities. And then for a second, we stop again. New news cycle, one day or two. And then we forget again. This Omran Daknesh became a symbol. This was, it went viral, this picture. It was on every single newspaper I could um, see. Um, and this was in August. I think it was around the 20th of August, 18th, 20th of August, something like that. Omran Daknesh. It was a bit like the um, iconic picture of Island Kurdi, the kid who died in Bodrum and prompted um, the refugee, the little Syrian refugee from Kobane. And that picture prompted Merkel to open up 
eventually the doors of Germany to Syrian refugees. Nothing happened after this, the poor Omran. There are like 100 Omran Naknesh every day, but we paid attention for a new cycle. Now, kids like Omran Naknesh, because of the siege that again started on September the 19th, do not have any food. So there is not only the bunker busting bombs, there is this enormous humanitarian crisis. The Russians bombed water pumps too, which means they totally bombed, so the, the only two water tanks that were in East Aleppo, they bombed them both. About a year ago, an organization started drilling dwells. So each neighborhood had a couple of dwells. And this water was infected water. You could not really drink it, but people used it. But now they're drinking the water of dwells. But guess what? To get the water out of these wells that each neighbor in East Aleppo has, you need a pump. But one of the casualties of the siege is gasoline. So they're running out of gasoline, so pretty soon they will not be able to dug up the infected water they've been drinking ever since the siege started. Another thing that is happening is that there is no baby milk. So a couple of weeks ago, the first baby died because of, of, of no baby milk. One night I talked to this guy. He's a hero, in my opinion. His name is Khaled Masri. He's a France press young reporter. <laughs> Think about this poor guy. He was tortured and imprisoned by the regime for a year. He was imprisoned and tortured by Daesh for three months. When he came out of prison, he discovered that his mother died under a bombardment. He went straight to Aleppo, back home, and ever since, he never stopped taking pictures of orphans the very second they became so. And he never left, and he's 24. And he used to study law before everything changed. And one night I talked to him, and everything was dark, and I couldn't see his face. I, we talked on Skype, and I was feeling guilty because he was using to talk to me. The only, they called them Ampere, but the only battery that, that he had for the day, and he was spending six euros for one battery to recharge his mobile phone and his cameras. And he said, everything is dark here. People go to sleep at, at, at eight o'clock at and, and night, and they woke up at four. And then what do they do? And then they beg. And just like this city is full of ghosts. People are losing weight, we're skinny, and we're looking for food, and this is our life. And then Russian planes come. He said, he said he was dreaming of a tomato. He said that they were still having some rice and burgul, but you need gas to cook them. And one gas bombola, one of those cost it used, to call, it used to be $10, now it's $200. The revolutionary councils are making benzene, are making fuel, burning plastic. Some people are burning furniture from bombed houses to cook rice. Um, malnutrition is all over the place. Um, but again, the one thing that really hit me all the time, and I was talking to people who might die, he said, I don't know whether I'll be around tomorrow with these new bombs they're using. They're very scary. It's never been as bad as this. And they were saying, you know, we're running out. It's like in a month. We can resist a month, maximum two. But then if the siege continues, and it will continue because the elections are in November and a new president will be in January, so the siege will continue. And they're saying we can resisted probably by uh, until if we really, you know, pro probably until the end of the year and then, and then we'll die here. The doctor said that they had generators for a couple of months, two or three months. So analysts told me that Aleppo can resist the siege until at the end of the year. The fighters said they will die, no problem. They have ammunition. They will die there, they have no problem. They have a problem with the civilians. The civilians would like to leave immediately if they could. One fighter that I interviewed in Gaziantep told me the civilians, if someone, if an angel of death led the way, they would follow him until the end of the world. I'm, I'm quoting him, the angel of death. 
But so the regime, what is it doing? It's dropping leaflets. It's like there are scenes straight out of World War II. They're dropping leaflets, telling the population to surrender. Very well. But the city is encircled and surrounded. So what do you do if you want to surrender? Few different people told me that some people actually tried to surrender and they crossed the, 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 the no way, the no go zone on the front lines. There is this, this zone where there are trenches. Um, and so some people actually, they were so, you know, basically hungry that they crossed with their, raising their hands and snipers killed them. So I, 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 what the regime wants is the um, surrender of the fighters. Or eventually they will convince the fighters to let the civilians go and then just kill them all like they did in homes and in other, in smaller areas um, of Syria. Yet, what everybody was telling me, even in the direst, in these direst circumstances, in fact, drinking infected water, trying to figure out whether there is a piece of wood to cook um, the, the few, last few kilos of rice, um, is this sense of abandonment, really. And I, and, and I really couldn't, I really couldn't give them an answer. The guy who took this, the pictures that I showed you um, is 24, Luai Barakat. He was in Gaziantep. He fled, risking his life, because he has a six-month-old child. And he said, this is like, I can't, it's like my child, what happened to your child? He said, there was a gas attack. The gas attack was confirmed by two different doctors. There was a chlor attack in East Aleppo. And one day he was out and about trying to take pictures of the civil defense, taking people out of the rubble, and he heard that there was a gas attack in his neighborhood and the, the telephone system was down. Telephones are still working if you have the power, but the power is running out because you, there are satellites and there is Turk cell, there is roaming from Turkey. So the communication, if you can, charge your phones, are there. But there was, there was no, the phone lines were not working, so he knew of this gas attack in, in his neighborhood. So he was really, really worried. He ran home. He saw that the balcony um, was missing a piece. He rushed upstairs. And he found his seven-month-old baby yellow. And then, and, then, and then he said that he rushed to the hospital and the seven-month-old baby had to, you know, kind of be put on, on oxygen and I don't know what other um, medicine. And, and, and the doctor said that he had to do that. And, um, and the doctor actually also asked me, remember your red line about chemicals, so chemical attacks and Ruta, this is ongoing as well. And in that chemical attack, they did not kill the photographer's seven um, month old son, um, three women died. And you no know, one woman with three children died. So this is, you understand, this has been kind of, you, you listen to this and you listen to this and, and, in, and there is a sense of, of feeling impotent, feeling powerless. Um, you, you, you represent the world to them. And so when you talk to them, they scream at you and yell at you because this is what they can do, nothing else. One of the things that I want to leave you with, it's a story. I met this filmmaker from Aleppo, again, he left right before, he managed to leave right before the siege and he was stuck outside and he couldn't go back in. But they, all these people I talked to, they couldn't wait to go back in. And they knew that if they went back in, they would die, but that was their call and that was their life and they couldn't leave people inside living on their own. And this, stuff, and this filmmaker, a certain point told me how the situation of the women was horrible. It was about the women, it was about the orphans and the widows and how some men were helping them and taking second or third wives with the consent of the first wife, just to help the women who le were left with no protection at all. So this was going on. In Aleppo, there was to be um, a very open, west-looking kind of town. Now, m 
men who were marrying more than one woman just to support them, the ones who still had a little bit of means. And the other thing he said was, you see, what people do not understand is that these children, they open their eyes and they only know war. They only see body parts. They don't know what real life is. They think this is real life. And one day they will all be extremists. And he said, and this is their right. And I will leave you with this video. He's called Abu Wad. It means father of the flowers. And his young son, Ibrahim. For five years of hellish war, this pocket of serenity has been perhaps the most amazing survivor in Aleppo. Abu Wad runs the city's last garden center. <laughs> But Abu Wad's world is in rebel held Aleppo, and it's been bombed relentlessly by the Syrian regime and now the Russians. We met during a lull in the bombing earlier this year. Of the million people who lived in this part of the city, just 250,000 remain. And throughout this time, Abu Wad hasn't stopped bombing. Aleppo was one of the great cultural beauties of the world and one of the longest inhabited. Today, so much of it has been laid waste and thousands have been killed. Defiant with all this, Abu Wa's whole existence seems dedicated to the beauty of life. This customer chooses rosemary plants. Rosemary, not for remembrance here, as much as resistance. <laughs> Some Aleppans buy the flowers and plant them on roundabouts in the city. Small islands of vitality, and surely a comfort to those who, by choice or lack of it, remain in Aleppo. Because to live here, is to live every day with grief. 13-year-old Ibrahim gave up school to stay close to his dad. He helps in the garden centre, but is clearly weighed down by the worries of war. Freshly cut flowers in the middle of Aleppo's war seems too extraordinary to believe. It didn't last. In the final days of May, six weeks after we met, the intense bombing by the Syrian regime and Russia began again. A bomb landed near the garden centre, but Abu Wan was hit and died immediately. The nursery is closed, 
nobody comes to buy flowers anymore. And this is where Abu Wad, the gardener of Aleppo, is buried, with no blooms to decorate the graves. Without his dad, Ibrahim seems lost. In time, perhaps he will remember how his father described the cycle of life. بيساعد العالم بيروح عن نفس المنظر الوردي بلاد احلى منه اللي بيشوف الورد هي بتمتع بجمال رب العالمين اللي خلق لنا اياه ومن شكل يحتى اي 12 قلب 12 روح يعني اساس الدنيا كلها يحتى الورد This was on uh, Channel 4 actually, not the BBC, Channel 4 and um, I think I will take your questions now. Thank you very much and, and for being, showing us your feelings about this ghastly, ghastly humanitarian tragedy. Do you have any hope for the peace talks or are they all a sham? No, 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 not until you have in Washington DC um, a new president. And what the Russians are and the, the Syrian regime is doing right now is trying to establish facts on the ground that, that eventually when next year the peace process will resume, there will be facts on the ground. This is what they're doing and they're ready to take Aleppo and they're ready to kill 200,000 people to do so. So not, not until January, not until next year. So until next year will be this. This is what it is. Actually, this is paradise com compared to, this was in May, April, May, the Channel 4 story, the video that I just showed you. This was like, you know, Eden compared to what's going on right now. There were flowers. Now the land is just burial sites all over. The, there are no flowers. So no, yeah, no, it's pretty, it's pretty gloom and doom. You mentioned that um, you don't believe in the peace talks as long, or like any peace talks, as long as like there's no, like a new president. But um, what do you think of the current like elect elective candidates that are running now? Like a lot of them s seem, I don't know, I feel like a lot of them would be along the same lines as Obama. No, I don't think so. Um, I think that uh, Trump has always shown his sympathy for Putin. And um, so that, that, that would be um, an alignment, I think. Then who, know, who knows what, you know, I don't, I don't want even want to think about a Trump president, actually, frankly speaking, because they would be abysmal on so many levels. But um, uh, I, I think that the two are pretty much alike and they like each other. And so that would mean that there would be a, yeah, a, a sort of alignment, I think, along the Russian positions. So, well, I mean, Trump is saying that all, that, you know, that he's implying that Muslims are terrorists. But, uh, and so I don't think the guy really knows what he's talking about. So um, Hillary, I think, um, has shown a certain point, um, her displeasure. I think Hillary will probably do something, but I'm a bit scary about what she might do because she has to prove being a woman that she can take also tough decision. It's very um, up in the air. It's very up in the air. I think she will definitely do something, but you see this was a war 
Like in World War II when Hitler took Poland and no one did anything thinking that he would be happy with Poland, you know. It was exactly the same thing. I'm not a fan of Erdogan, the president of Turkey, is an authoritarian figure. But he said something right at the very beginning. He said back in 2012 we need a no-flight zone. Back in 2012 there were no Russians. So a no-flight zone would have meant that people could stay in Syria. We would not have had five million refugees because the, what is causing the refugees is the jets bombing them. But now a no-flight zone means going to war with Russia, having a proxy war with Russia because the, the jets bombing are Russians. So it's complicated. First, you know, thank you very much. It was a really impressive thank you. debate. Uh, the one person no one seems to hear about who is involved is uh, Assad. Mm. I mean, we know that uh, mm. Russia is interested in having an arrangement whereby they can keep their bases in Syria, in the Mediterranean. But you, know, you, you look at Assad and you think, what is he trying to achieve? Because even if he obtains control over Aleppo and the whole of Syria, he's left with a disaster zone, having killed his own people. I mean, does anyone know what uh, is really in his mind? If you, if you read a little, it's like, it's history repeating itself. Um, if you look at Syrian history back in the 80s, that's what the father did, Hafez. Hafez Assad leveled a neighborhood of Aleppo back in 1980 and then leveled the entire center of Hama back in 92 because there was a rebellion by the Muslim Brotherhood. He actually leveled downtown Hama back in 1982. The people in power in the Muhabarat, in the secret service and intelligence and in the defense are the same, are the same people. Young Bashar, that went to power back in 2000 at 35, they changed the constitution because his brother Basil died, but anyway, Young Bashar inherited the system, inherited the regime. It's the same men. They don't care about destroying a city or a country. They want to stay in power. And so that's their end game. Right now, the game is to see, so this is why he's, he's making all these grand statements about we will get back all of Syria. This is what he's saying. And it's true, he can, he can, because right now he's controlling Damascus and the coast. And he wants Aleppo, so he can divide the two sides, you know, the Daesh side and the Nusra side, the other opposition land. So Aleppo is smack in the middle, and then you have the Kurds in the north. So if he gets Aleppo, it means he's in the north. It's not a Canton kind of little state. But in the end, they will be divided. Syria will be divided. So right now, the, the, the fight is for his poles. Who gets what exactly? The Russians have this small base in Tartus that now has become a bit larger, but there was nothing really. Yes, it's their place in the Med, but there was really nothing. This is not about Tartus. This is about the ambitions of Putin and how he wants to use Syria to you know, play uh, Soviet Union again. You know, we're a big power and we can see with all the others. And plus there are the sanctions that the international community um, uh, 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 put on, on, on Putin, on Russia for invading Ukraine. So he wants you, he's using Syria as a negotiating chip. It's not going very well because there are crimes against humanity committed in Syria and there are people who are actively collecting evidence on the ground. So the ball will keep bouncing. I have, I have a lot of contacts there. Most of the people that I, that I quoted are there. Like the Sheikh is there, he's burying people and singing. Mm. He's burying peace, body parts and singing. The doctors are all there. Right. Only four surgeons for 200,000 people, four surgeons. four surgeons. 24 doctors, only half of them are trained. Terrible. This is a urologist who's performing, because in a war zone, you need bone doctors, sure. you need orthopedics, you know, they're cutting bones because mm -hmm. they don't have staff to do the job. Mm -hmm. So the doctors are there. These kids, they, some, some of the, the, their kids really, because they're, 20, they're, they're your age. Some of these kids, one of the kids who I interviewed, whom I interviewed, whose child was seven months and was yellow because he, he smelled the chloral. 
I can't wait to go back in because he says, all my friends are there and if we have to die, we'll have to die together. Because if there is one thing the war does, it's, it's just... The war brings out the best and the worst in human beings, really. It's Darwinism, but it's also generosity. It is most... Um, really amazing way because I can't, like a doctor who has, who has money, a house in Turkey, wife and small kids, has made the choice of living in hell to help his own people just because they're, and, and, and they're targeting them and they're killing them. It's like they were 21. Now there, there were 21 hospitals, now there are six hospitals. Every day they've been targeted. They, don't, they, they just do it because they think it's right. Yeah, but the doctors, the doctors and the civil defense workers and, and the civilians are really the, the ones who can't, the, the, the poor of the poor, the orphans, the kids, the, and the family of the fighters. The family of the fighters, they're there too. Another thing that probably I should have mentioned, Nusra. Everyone is talking about Nusra al-Qaeda being in East Aleppo. I interviewed again all these people, they all told me that there are no more than 200 Nusra inside of East Aleppo because Nusra al-Qaeda is actually in the east in Idlib. So, 200 Nusra. Anyway. The millions of refugees in Turkey, and Lebanon, and Jordan, first of all, I don't know whose side they're on, but eventually, you know, their peace will eventually come in Syria. Do you think they'll all go back? No, not all. I think, I think the... Um, I think the older generation will go back. I think the revolutionaries will never go back. Because the revolu meaning the activists, the fighters are dying in huge numbers. Um, the activists, the doctors, people like me and you, they'll never go back. I, I know many of them. They're all heavily traumatized. For them, Syria is hell. They were all Tortured, tortured, seriously tortured. They will never go back. For them, Syria doesn't exist anymore. The older generation will go back, probably. The civilians, yeah, yeah, most of them are civilians. Most of them are civilians, yeah. They will go back, yeah. They will, of course they will go back. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the revolutionaries. The revolutionaries will not go back. The civilians will go back. Um, here's a story that might reinforce what you just said, or it might be like the flower story. There's a group of students, Syrian students in exile, in Central European University. And they had to leave Syria, they had to leave Aleppo, which is their home. And there at Central European University, they are doing something called the Aleppo Project. You know, you know the Aleppo, and then they are for the rest of you, that, and you correct me if I'm wrong about this, they are in any way possible getting in touch with as many Syrian refugees as possible. They use social media, they use questionnaires, and they're trying to draw up the Aleppo they want to go back to. So if and when they can go back, they will have a plan. They're 22, 23, and they are there with the Aleppo project. You see, now, as a, for example, they took Homs back, right? But the part of Homs that they took back, Wire, is the neighborhood. I don't know if you see some pictures. It's really kind of, I mean, uh, 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 it's really bad. Um, but people are not going back because where do they go back to? So if we're talking, it's like if we're talking, even reconstruction, it's like Kobani is, I think, a good example. Kobane was occupied by ISIS, was bombed by the coalition, by America, mostly. Um, I went to Kobane, 70% of Kobane is down, but it's a small place, right? I mean, Aleppo, it's a big city. Kobane is a small place, it's down, leveled. And, uh, and some people went back. A lot of people went back. I would say probably 30, 40% of the population, but you live in rubbles. It's like living in a quake zone. And their choice is, what do we do? Do we stay in a camp or do we live in a quake zone? It's hard, I mean, we're talking about hard choices. We're talking short term, it's very hard. Long term, they're probably, I don't know, 
It all, it all depends on their means. The poor ones will go back. The educated ones will make a new home wherever they are because they have the means, they have education. Eva, can you talk a little more about reporting, the difficulty of reporting? Do you, have, you said you had sources inside Aleppo, which do you have somebody looking for sources, yeah. a kind of on the ground yeah. person who's suggesting? And do you talk to the refugees who have left to add to your kind of composite I, information. Mm -hmm. Because I lived in Beirut, people don't realize that Beirut is 135 kilometers from Damascus and um, it's uh, 80 kilometers from the border, 90 kilometers from the border. So I used to go to Syria a lot and I know a lot of Syrians. Um, but in this particular case, I have my Syrian friends in different sides of the border. So I have someone when I go to Jordan, I have someone when I go to Lebanon, I have someone when I go to Turkey. When I go to Turkey, there is a friend of mine whose name is Omar. It's not his real name, um, because the regime, his family is still in Damascus and the regime is looking for him. But anyway, so Omar, we established a very strong relations and a very, and, 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 um, because when he was still in Damascus, I went underground with him. And that is bonding as an experience. It was back in 2012, it was when the regime started bombing, um, and there was a time where it was still possible getting a tourist visa in the Beka to cross from Lebanon into Syria, for Europeans only. And I used to live in Lebanon, and so I had this strange idea that I was going to pretend to be a professor at the American University in Beirut, and I was a Christian, and I had to go to the Sidenaya pilgrimage site because I wanted to get pregnant, and that was my story. And I was the only white person, the only foreigner at the Masna point at the border. They all looked at me like I was crazy, but they bought the story. So I got in with a tourist visa, but I was a journalist, so I went underground with Omar. And Omar was recommended by a dear friend and colleague in Beirut. So you need trust. Omar needed to trust me, and I needed to trust him, because it was dangerous. Because if they got, if they got us, Omar would be killed, I'd be arrested, and maybe who knows what. So this is how I met Omar. And we went there, we worked together. Then he had to flee, and he's now in Gaziantep. And whenever I go to the border, I work with Omar. Omar, by the way, was the boyfriend of Kyla Mueller. The American hostage was killed. American hostage that was captured by ISIS, okay? And he helped the family of Jim Foley and all of that. But anyway, so Omar is someone who knows everyone. He used to be an activist in Damascus. And he knows everyone. And Omar is one of the many Syrians that I'm always in touch with. So before going to a place like Gaziantep to work on Raqqa on, on Raqqa or Aleppo, I talk to Omar and I'll tell him what I need and what I want. And so he kind of, and we talk and talk and talk. And he says, okay, there is this person that I think is really good, this other person. And I'll tell him what I want, basically. And, 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 and here in this case, it was obvious that I needed people that um, I could interview about the siege. But I, what, what I really wanted was to get a sense who were the people inside. And so when he delivered Sheikh Abush, who was very famous and they all like him, for me it was very important because he was not really covered, you know, a Sufi guy. So there is a lot of preparation. And then, of course, you have to have the right contact. Um, and, and, and Omar opened all the doors. And in, and in the end, in this kind of circumstances, you just need to talk to a lot of different people to double check the information. Omar still believes that she's alive, but um, I think he's deluding himself. The real story, I believe, is that she, Okay, I, I know for sure the, the beginning of the story. The beginning was that they, they were together in Aleppo. Omar will never forgive himself for this, I think. They were together in Aleppo in front of the children's hospital. And, uh, and then uh, Omar is Syrian and Kyla was his fiance. And they got them and they arrested them and they separated them. And then he was released after a few months of, uh, yeah. torture, anyway. Uh, and then he managed to go back in and see her again. And actually, he was able to go in again because he found this sheikh inside of ISIS, a Saudi guy. And the Saudi guy sent him back and got him an appointment. And this other sheikh was, <laughs> you probably, it was huge. It was Adnani. Adnani used to be the number two of Baghdadi. 
He was killed recently in a strike near El Bab by coalition forces. So he had Adnan in front of him, and he said, why are you saying she's your wife? She's not saying you're a husband. In the end, she, he saw her again for a few minutes, and she cried, and uh, she seemed thin but in good health, he said. After that, he was released a few months later. She sent him letters. Then she was in Raqqa, and... If you remember, there was the case of the Jordanian pilot who was burnt alive in a cage in Raqqa. That was the moment when the Jordanians not only executed immediately a couple of Qaeda characters, including the woman dead in prison for the wedding bombings in Amman. The king was still in D.C. on a plane, going back to Amman, and the woman was, was executed in the morning. Um, and then the Jordanian um, aviation, the Jordanian Air Force became heavily involved in the bombardment of Raqqa. And what they did, because these guys were really clever in their propaganda, what they said, and what, what they said was that Kaila was killed in a bombing of the Jordanian Air Forces. Of course, that's bogus. Um, the family saw pictures of the body. Omar refused to see those pictures, um, but the family is quite confident it was her body. They killed her. I, I think it's unlikely that she was killed in a Jordanian bombing. They just killed her as a revenge um, for, for the Jordanian bombardment and for the whole... Kasazbe was the pilot who was born alive. When was she killed? Uh, I think she was 26 or 27, something like that. Yeah, they were supposed to get married. Anyway, yeah, this is what I know of the story, sure. No, right now, it's impossible. Right now, everyone told me that not even a match can get inside. Um, and there is because there was a previous siege that lasted about a month that was broken by the, the rebels. Nusra arrived from Idlib, and another Islamist group arrived from Idlib and broke the siege, and the rebels were really grateful. But the previous siege was enforced only by the Air Force. Um, the Russians were bombing. This time around, they actually have in Iraqis, Iranians, and Hezbollah, they surrounded the places. They have ground forces enforcing the siege. So if the rebels don't manage to break the siege, nothing gets in. And by the end of the year, it will be over. It will fall. Aleppo will fall. But what about another ceasefire? Is that possible? Or is that well, you know what they did? The Russians? They announced eight towers. An eight hour ceasefire on Thursday. Tomorrow, eight hours. Yeah, that's a very decent ceasefire. But right now they're really happy that the Mosul thing is going on because the news cycle, you know, the, the, the journalists are really um, on Mosul and so they can do whatever they want, really. So as long as they don't kill 100 people per day, as they did at the end of September, you know, they can still kill. What they're doing right now, they're killing about between 30 and 50 every day. So that doesn't make the news cycle. Yesterday, they killed a family of 14. The whole entire family of 14 was in a basement. They, got, they, they dropped a, 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 a bunker-busting bomb on a building. 14 family members were killed. That doesn't make the news. The outrage. I'm outraged. <laughs> I'm a witness. I'm not an activist. I'm a reporter, but I'm frankly outraged. And so I think, and, and there is a lot of propaganda going on. There are, it's like, it's like nothing pisses me off more than a colleague that I, that I thought was fair, that a colleague writing the, the jihadist or the terrorist in Istalepo, that really pisses me off. That's a pretty powerful feeling that keeps, that keeps me going. I'm, I'm pissed off, <laughs> I'm really pissed off. Yeah, I think it's outrageous, indecent. And join me in thanking Ima for a very powerful talk, as usual. Thank you, Ima. Thank you very much.